Yell hip array and sing and shout, the blooming range is counted out. Rejoice ye all and everyone, we've changed the name to Lavington. At eight o'clock the hall was full, and the organ roared like Barney's ball. Then someone tried a song to sing, and we all yelled, God save the king. Now the club they called the Glee began to sing most awfully, and when the bass put in its boat, it would break the heart of Charlie's Oak. Then someone yapped and newt the range, and someone spoke, we Lavington. We all agreed we liked the change, and while we gormadised like fun, now after the hall was cleared, and all the men who were not bid, danced and sang, and ere the morning sun, we unhooked three cheers for Lavington. Yes, well there was a Progress Association meeting in 1908, about November 1908, and uh, the two of the subjects at the meeting was firstly to um, uh, apply to the Crown for 20 acres of recreational ground, and the second was to change the name from Black Range to whatever. They then, between themselves, put the name Lavington forward, um, and they, uh, they were, the meeting was happy with that, because at the time there was already a hotel named the Lavington, and the original gold stamper that, sh that arrived here in 1865 was also commissioned the Lavington and uh, one of the two former hotels in this area, in the Black Range area, was also called the Lavington. So they settled on the name Lavington and um, they uh, asked the firm G to um, uh, gazette it and in due course they did. I've been in this street since 1918. This house wasn't there, Ben. The little house down the below, that's where Tommy Pearsall was born. <laughs> and I think I bathed him more mornings going to school than his mother did. <laughs> Do you remember that during the, the war they had something called the Lavington Follies with the young girls in it? Do you remember oh, that? Oh, they were always getting something together. Oh, oh, we used to always have a once a year fruit down the hall and we'd have it for two days, Friday and Saturday and they'd have all these competitions, jams and everything and we'd have a big, you sit there, you've seen the pyramid of apples? Mm -hmm. they, they, that used to be in the uh, wood shop and they'd have a great time, but I don't know about the follies of, oh yes I do, yes I was one in the minute. Oh Christ. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I, yes I remember them, now they come to think of it. <laughs> You're just little egg. It was a very, very amateur. <laughs> I can tell you that. I don't know how I managed it. <laughs> the old horse was very common. He was used in the, in the paddocks. He was used uh, carting wood, carting water. Um, quite a few were ridden to school. There was uh, quite a few people rode a horse to school. The school had its own horse paddock, and uh, one of the teachers um, also uh, drove a horse in Sockbeard. The, uh, the the bread was carted in the in, in the baker's cart um, uh, during the war, sometimes by women uh, women driver. Green grocer come round with the uh, veggies in the cart. Um, the ice people come round uh, with the ice in the in the horse drawn wagon. We came to Lavington in 1941, and um, all the vehicles those days were, you know, basically the square models. They were 27. Chevy Utes, the old 1911 Beans, um, Durandis, Overlanded Whippets, they were really old square truck type utilities, uh, but there were very few cars, uh, you know, uh, in, in the early days. And then after the uh, end of the Second World War, uh, with the reduction back in America and Britain, there was quite an influx of um, cars, and they found their way to Aubrey quite readily, you know, there was 47, 48, there was new Chevs and Pontiacs and Hillmans and Humbers from Britain. Old yeah. Dick Martin had about one bus, that's the, the fellow that started it up, and he had a big garage in the back of his house there to shed the buses, and then eventually he bought more land down in Bellevue Street and built three or four great big sheds as he got bigger and got more buses. During the war they had great big gas bags up on top. 
and that'd do him about free trip from Albury to Lavington on his bus run, and he'd have to go back and fill her up again. Petrol was rationed, you'd only get a few gallons. And them people, had, uh, if you only had a private car, you might only get four or five gallons for the month. You just had to be very careful where you used it. Clothing was rationed in the form that you had to provide coupons to buy them, and butter and tea, of course, the same. And so you are, each family, according to the number of children, was allocated by the government a certain number of coupons. And they, when they were gone, that was it. You, you, even if you had the money, you wouldn't be able to purchase the goods, and tobacco and so forth. That was, uh, whilst I don't know there was so much, there was, wasn't coupons for tobacco, it was ration, it was what we referred to as under the counter. And uh, if you were to go into a tobacconist or a general store and ask for cigarettes or tobacco, unless you were well known, a local, um, the answer would be that there was none for sale. But if you were well known, he'd simply put his hand under the counter and pick out a bag of tobacco or a bag of cigarettes and duly sold them. I don't know, we were, they were all good times in the old days. We would make our own fun and everything was good. One time you could get around never shut your doors, do anything, just walk out and everything would be there when you come back, but it's not now. <laughs> Uh, you know, ferreting and setting traps, you know, rabbiting, catching rabbits was a, was a thing that sort of occupied so many children on the weekend, both as a form of, of meat for the house and, uh, and also pocket money. And um, I know as a, um, as a young child, you know, eight or nine, uh, we had a particular customer who uh, had a, an order for a half grown rabbit every Saturday morning to be delivered at 10 a.m., uh, sixpence delivered to the door. Mm. I just tell my grandkids, my daughter's got three boys, they, they don't know they're alive. We used to ride from over in Urana Road down to where the Aubrey Pool is now for a swim of a Sunday. We'd get, have sixpence, it'd be threepence for old Mr Roxburgh to get into the gate of the pool, and you'd have threepence for an ice cream or something after you had a swim for two or three hours and then you'd ride the bike home again. And they used to go down to Moore Street pool, their mother would drive them down in the car and go back down and pick them up again, you know. I say, you blacks don't know you're alive. <laughs> well, no, I was nearly going to go on with that, but I, I just, yeah, the old sanitary card, it, uh, it, uh, McKinley and Lennon was the two, was the two people who had the contract, and uh, it seemed to be the go that, uh, that, uh, that when it got to our place, it must have been time to shuffle the cans, and uh, there would be a great racket out there for ten minutes or so as they pushed the full ones to the front and the empty ones to the back and in due course they'd roar off to the next house, yeah. Mm. And it was a very hard four years those, when those fire bugs were around because we had property on one side of the hill and the other side of the hill and they, they set fire to both sides. But up the other way they burnt down hay sheds, the shearing shed, which we only just put a $6,000 new shearing plant into it. It was used once and then burnt to the ground. And the, there was a hay shed up further, they burnt that down. We replaced it and they burnt it down again. Ron, my son Ron, he went up and he he went up and he thought, my goodness, it's burnt down again. So he started to come home to tell his dad and he thought, oh, is it burnt down? So he turns around and goes back to make, <laughs> make sure he got such a shock he couldn't really take it all in. We, there was always someone on the property, night and day. Uh, the younger ones used to go out, but Ron and I were always at home because we had to eat, had to shed. <laughs> Thank you.